Hello fellow rockers, today I'm going to review the brand new Rolling Stones album Hackney Diamonds and we're going to figure out if this is one last victory lap or a walk of shame into the sunset. Isn't it amazing, it's 2023 and we're reviewing a brand new Rolling Stones album. I thought this band was old already back in 85 at Live 8, we called them veteran old rockers back then or whatever, something like that. And here we are 38 years later reviewing a new album. It's their second album in this millennium with original material since 2005, A Bigger Bang. And uh, it says it all about this band that we use millennials to measure their discography because they'll probably be around in the year 3000, kind of judging by the way that things have been going so far. It's one of the first, actually it's the first album that I'm a little bit afraid of reviewing uh, for a few different reasons. First of all, my mom fed me this stuff when I was young, so I, you know, it's kind of, I have a duty towards my mom to love this band no matter what. So if they have a bad album, I'm going to piss off my mom if I say something bad about it. Uh, and actually the previous stuff, I would say almost for the last 30 years or something, hasn't really been anything kind of to write home about. You know, it's been fun to see them live, but you know, the albums that have been coming out since the late 80s haven't really been good. I heard the single of this album, Angry, and I smelled something. And then I started checking out, and yes, it's Andrew Watt, the guy that did the last Aussie album. He's done Justin Bieber, he's done Lady Gaga. There is something about his sound sometimes that I just don't like. And I was afraid, okay, are we going to put the stones through this machine? Uh, and then the biggest mistake I did, I actually read the Pitchfork Review, and I will just read for you and you can see it on the screen. <laughs> they say, alongside producer Andrew Watt, they turn every trick they can, conjure just one more hit, one more chance to cash in. They try and fail to reinvigorate themselves in the rock and roll fountain of youth they helped create. Only to emerge with a dozen hackneyed duds. And I was like, afterwards, I was like, shit. But then I thought, what the heck? I'm not sure I'll get a chance again to review an album by this band. And uh, so with that skepticism, I went to work. I listened on my morning run with my special assistant during my morning coffee at the barber with John Lennon uh, watching over. And then I ended up doing something that I didn't expect to do afterwards. More on that later. Before we dive into the music, a little bit of the formalities, if you can call it like that. It's 12 songs, 48 and a half minutes. Uh, the cover is, is kind of a, a diamond being split by a, a knife and uh, heart-shaped diamond and it doesn't really make me think of Rolling Stone somehow this this cover and it more made me think about kind of Celine Dion having another heartbreak love song or something like that but then when I read what Hackney Diamonds actually means then it kind of makes sense because uh, that means kind of glass from a store or a car window after a robbery and uh, it makes more sense because they have always kind of considered themselves as street kids from London commoners if you will uh, it starts off the album with uh, the song Angry, which had been released as a single. And as I said, that's where I smelled Andrew Watt somehow. And I wasn't very impressed. Uh, it has all the kind of the Rolling Stones jazz somehow, but nothing that hooked me. And the biggest thing actually on that song that kind of left me was some grammar stuff, you know, because they say angry with me and I thought it was angry at me. But I don't know, you tell me guys. The next song is called Get Close and it features Elton John on the piano. Um, that kind of song I kind of liked more, uh, but and it has kind of a catchy chorus, but I was hoping to hear Elton sing because, you know, he's kind of, you know, I don't know, putting on the curtains on his career and I would would, would have loved to see and hear, hear him sing with uh, uh, Mick Jagger and with the Stones. But there are more guests on this album. I mean, they bring on a Beatle, Paul McCartney. Uh, he plays bass in a song called Bite My Hat Off. It's a very kind of fast paced, energetic song and you get the feeling that uh, they played that song together in the studio somehow. You have, that's the feeling that you get from that song. Uh, it has a very high energy and a very raw sound and Paul plays like a cool bass thing in after like two minutes where, you know, Mick says, oh, Paul, bring us some bass. That's kind of cool, you know, it gets a nostalgic feeling somehow. This is actually not the first time that the Beatles and the Stones work together. I'm going to put a link in the comment below. Uh, to an article that said, talks about, I think, six times that these bands have kind of crossed paths and worked together. So check that out in the first comment to this video. So now we're two guests in, uh, both um, <laughs> Elton John and Paul McCartney, and neither of them gets to sing. And then I knew that they had Lady Gaga, and I was thinking, okay, so they're going to make her play the harmonica or something like that. But 
they l allow her to sing. And she sings on a song called uh, Sweet Sounds of Heaven. And that generate that song generates a lot of kind of goosebump moments. She is a, an amazing singer. And, um, and to top it off, then she has uh, a little less known guy called Stevie Wonton on the piano and the keyboards. Uh, I would have loved to hear him sing on that song also, but I mean, Lady Gaga does an amazing job on that song. An 86-year-old ex-Rolling Stones member, Bill Wyman, joins on the bass in a song called Live by the Sword. It's his first studio recording with the band since 1989 on Steel Wheels. And on that song, we have Elton John on the piano. I mean, how crazy is this? The Stones kind of reunited, minus, of course, uh, rest in peace, Charlie Watts. But, you know, Bill Wyman is there and Elton John is on the piano. Cool stuff. Um, it made me wonder, you know, like when I was listening to this, is this, um, are they trying to kind of decorate themselves with some feathers of others? But on the other hand, they have always done this, you know, the Stones have always worked with others, you know, Mick Jagger worked with David Bowie, they worked with Tina Turner, uh, Fergie, and, uh, you know, so th there have been other people that they have been working with, and they've always brought in some amazing uh, singers, for example, if you think about Gimme Selter, for example, they, they had this amazing girl singing in that song. So... I don't know. I think this is just a way for them to spice things up a little bit over 12 songs, you know? So the highlight songs of this album for me are, uh, first of all, it's a song called Tell Me Straight that Keith Richards sings. I've always been kind of a Keith man, and this is a bit of a kind of melancholic song. And, you know, the lyrics are about, you know, wanting to hear the truth if his future is all in the past. It's, it's a nice, it's a really nice song, actually, and it kind of grows. But there's also something in it that I just figured out. It reminds me of that song, Who Can It Be Now? I don't remember the name of the band, but you'll figure that out. You can check that, Who Can It Be Now? Um, Sweet Sounds of Heaven, the song that they do with Lady Gaga and then with, uh, with uh, Stevie Wonder on the, on the keyboards and piano. Uh, that's a song that could easily have been made by them like 40, 50 years ago. It's, uh, I mean, but it doesn't sound old or anything like that, but it's, you know, she wasn't born back then, so they couldn't make that song with her then, so they're making it now. And she really adds somehow to the dynamic of that song. It has kind of a bluesy uh, soul feeling, and I really like that song. It's really cool, and there is a video out with that on, on YouTube, I think, or some videos, which are really, really great. Uh, another song that I like is the song called Driving Me to Heart. That's a song that kind of makes me accept Andrew Watt as a producer of this album. Uh, this song could easily have been nothing. It could have been just a, some formulated uh, stone song on a bigger bang or, or, or some of the, the albums that came between the 80s and, and now. And, uh, but there's something in this song with the arrangement and the soloing, and there are other songs like that, like there's this whole white world that is also the same thing, you know, like he adds something or I believe that it was him in the arrangement, the soloing and kind of the soundscape that that makes these songs good and they they hook you in. Uh, so actually after listening to the album kind of repeatedly I realized that my concerns were unnecessary. You know I could make my mom proud. Uh, I don't dislike Andrew Watt as much as I did in the beginning and uh, Pitchfork might not be on to something after all. And just for you guys, I'm going to put the Pitchfork review in the first comment to this uh, video so you can see that down there and read for yourself because after listening to the album, I realized these guys are on some different planet than me. So my verdict on the album, uh, the pros on the of the album is that it kind of grows on me. You know, it, uh, the more I listened, the more I liked it. Uh, actually, the run turned out to be longer than I planned, nine kilometers instead of six because I liked this album and I wanted to listen more. Uh, the guest appearances really give it a, both some nostalgic feeling with Paul McCartney, Elton John, Stevie Wonder and all that, but also a different dynamic with Lady Gaga. Uh, there is some spark in this album that I've been missing for uh, yeah over 30 years or something in their music, and I want to kind of contribute part of that to, to Andrew Watt. No disrespect to the band or anything, they're great, they're amazing, but something changed. Um, it's good songwriting, it's true to the formula and hooks you in, but it's not a copy of their earlier work somehow. I don't feel that. Or if it is, then it's done in a very subtle way, in a very nice way, because it is the Stones, but it's not like the Stones used to be. Um, it's a good mix of slower and faster energetic songs, and uh, the song order is good. You know, you, you, there is no skipping here. I didn't skip anything, and I will listen to this album more, and that's actually a good thing. Uh, the negatives, uh, 
there are some songs where I feel that the sound is a little bit too polished, you know, somehow for the Stones, because they always had this, for me, like, ah, oh, it doesn't really matter if it's a little bit off here or there or something. It wasn't always perfect, and the beauty of the Stones was always the imperfection somehow. Uh, that's not on this album. Uh, and some of the songs, the good songs, could have been nicer, even nicer, if they would be a little bit more raw. Uh, they could have used the guests differently. It's silly to say, use Paul McCartney differently. I mean, who am I to say that? But I mean, it would have been great to hear him sing something. It would have been great to hear Elton John sing, Stevie Wonder sing. Uh, Bill Wyman, at least he got to play his instrument. Uh, my rating, it's hard to give this album a rating because I mean, the albums kind of up to the end of the 80s were all like nine, ten albums. These are iconic albums. They kind of created that genre, you know, they, they laid the foundation for rock and roll. So if I think about those all at like nine to ten, then I have to give this album like 8.5. It's by far their best album since I think yeah, uh, Tattoo You or something like that. Um, and uh, for sure, yeah, the best album since the end of the 70s. Let's say it like that. Yeah, and as I said, I, I actually went out and did something I didn't expect, as I told you earlier. I, I bought the album on the way home from the barber, or on the way to the studio, let's say. The studio is not where I live. So I bought it in the record store, bought the vinyl. It's a nice, like, uh, gatefold, Rolling Stones in the middle, diamond in the front, and the songs on the back. And uh, I will play this album for sure. I didn't expect this when I started, uh, and... Uh, you know, I kind of, yeah, I kind of thought that I wouldn't like this album, but I actually like it, so 8.5. Um, why I was not surprised about this album is that I actually went to see The Stones live last year in Stockholm, and you can actually check out my concert review here. And on that concert, they didn't really go out with a big bang, no pun intended. You know, like, I, th I thought, you know, when this band plays his final note, there are going to be fireworks, there's going to be this, there's going to be that, there's going to be... All. There was nothing like that. There was no hearty goodbyes to the fans or anything like that. So I knew then this is not it. And now we have this, and I'm pretty sure there's going to be a tour uh, at least next year, probably in the next two years or something. So like and subscribe this video, check my other album reviews and my concert reviews that you can find here in those two playlists. And see you guys around. Thank you. Bye-bye.